Okay, I guess we're recording. Uh, I'll get this thing straightened out eventually. Um, okay, um, there's nine, well, this is chapter nine. <laughs> there are six chapters left and we have six weeks left in the semester. So we're gonna tackle a, 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 a chapter a week. I'll probably just do one PowerPoint or, or one uh, lecture uh, for each chapter. It'll be easier. I, I should be able to get through this uh, in in a, in a couple hours anyway, one way or the other. Okay, so this uh, this chapter is about cognition and perception, and the difference between east and west. Once again, um, Heine, Heine, Heine <laughs> has an interesting perspective as far as um, as far as the east and west is concerned. He uh, He's from Canada, he's from Western Canada. And um, after he graduated from college, he went over to Japan to, to teach English. And while he was over there, he married a Japanese woman. And because of that, uh, he has a different perspective or an interesting perspective on, uh, on people from the East and people from the West. And their way of thinking, and, and, and they are different. I mean, there's, there are differences, and we're going to talk about that. It may have something to do with what's going on right now. The uh, uh, concepts in, uh, in China are, are a little bit different than they are in the United States. So when they came down with this, uh, the pandemic, when coronavirus first started in China, they had a different perspective on it than we do in the United States, or than Western man has. Um, they, because they are more holistic, uh, because they're more collectivistic, uh, they follow rules uh, a little bit better than we do as, as Americans or we do as Westerners. And that may be one of the reasons why uh, Italy has had problems, uh, why it spread through, so has spread through, so widely through uh, Washington, not Washington, well, Washington State, they had that, uh, that one, uh, cruise ship that came in, and that may be their problem. But New York City, of course, has a really terrible, has an interesting problem uh, because uh, they um, uh, they don't follow the rules. They they think of themselves as individualistic, and, and so they don't follow the rules. The, uh, the governor of the state was on television the other night, and he was saying, well, he's not going to do a lockdown in New York City because if he were in New York City and they locked uh, the, down the, the city, he would just go someplace else where they didn't have a lockdown. And of course, he's he's saying he's not going to do it because because it wouldn't work. And he's probably right. And that's probably what happened. You know, people tell you to not go to bars and, and, and not go to restaurants. And what happens next? You want to go to the bar and you want to go to the restaurant. But we'll be talking about all that uh, uh, today as we're talking about cognition and, and perception. Um, there's a difference between analytic and holistic thinking, of course. Analytic thinking is more Western, holistic thinking is more, is more Eastern, as it were. Um, if we were, we were asked to, this is a fairly classic case, uh, where they talk about, uh, dogs and, uh, a, a dog, a rabbit, and a, and a carrot. How would you, how would you categorize them? And the there of course there's two obvious answers. One answer is well the dog and the and the rabbit are both mammals. They're both alive. They're both animals. Uh, so we'll put them together. And then the uh, the carrot of course is is a vegetable. Uh, so we'll separate the carrot from the from the two uh, the two animals. Or you could categorize it uh, uh, by looking at uh, the fact that. Rabbits eat carrots. Of course, dogs don't eat carrots, so we would put the rabbit and the carrot together, obviously, because uh, the rabbit eats carrots and they don't eat dogs. And dogs, I guess dogs do eat rabbits sometimes. Not that dog, of course, <laughs> I'm guessing. So when stimuli are grouped to get, uh, according to the perceived similarity of their attributes, it is called a taxonomic categorization strategy. Uh, taxonomic categorization answers are especially common among Westerners. So we're more taxonomic. We, we try to put things in, in pigeonholes. We try to categorize things uh, because we are Westerners. 
Thematic categorization strategies where stimuli are grouped together on the basis of causal, temporal, or spatial relationships. And that's what I was just talking about, the fact that the rabbit eats uh, the carrot. We put the rabbit and the carrot together. Well, that's, that's um, uh, causal. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're different. It's, it's a different idea. Thematic categorization is especially common in East Asia. So Asians would have a difficult time categorizing these three things, what, would, what do you put together? Well, it really would all depend on the context uh, as to how they would view it. This difference in categorization strategies reflects an underlying difference in the ways that people attend to their worlds. They attend to their worlds in a holistic manner. We attend to our world in a more analytic manner. Analytic thinking is characterized by a focus on objects and their attributes, <clears throat> Objects are perceived as existing independently from their contexts. They are understood in terms of their component parts. Context is very important, as weird as that may seem. So when we're categorizing things, uh, and of course this happens when you're, when you're uh, if, if you've got a, a large group of, of tools or a large, large group of instruments, how in the world do you put all these things together? How do you categorize them? Uh, well, if we were if we are from the United States, if we're Western, of course, we would uh, take all the automobile parts and put them in one place, and we take all the the uh, the uh, computer parts and put them in another place, and we wouldn't we wouldn't mix the two. Uh, but if we were Eastern, uh, we might put all the wheels together, and we might put all the screws together. We might put all the the, uh, the uh, tubes together because that's the way we would see things. The attributes that make up uh, objects are used as a basis for categorizing them and a set of fixed abstract rules is used to predict and explain the behavior of these objects. Analytic thinking is more common in Western countries than in China, Japan, and Korea. And the reason I have this, this wonderful picture is because these are, are Eastern philosophers and Western philosophers. The Western philosophers are on the left, of course, and the Eastern philosophers are on the right, West and East. Get it? Okay. Holistic thinking is characterized by an orientation uh, to the context as a whole. It represents an associative way of thinking, which gives attention to the relations among objects and their surrounding context. And we're going to talk about this uh, as how it uh, changes your way of looking at the world, how it changes your way of per perceiving what is going on. In holistic thinking, uh, objects are understood in terms of how they relate to the rest of the context, and their behavior is predicted and explained on the basis of those relationships. So as far as holistic thinkers are concerned, everything is, is in, in, in a relationship. It's, it's relational. Uh, so if we were to uh, look at a situation such as, I uh, can't think of one right off the top of my head. <laughs> holistic thinking also emphasizes knowledge gained through experience rather than the application of fixed abstract rules. Holistic thinking is, of course, more common in East Asia. Um, pause it right here. I can't. Okay. Analytic thinkers tend to show field independence. They can separate objects from their background fields. Holistic thinkers tend to show field dependence. They tend to, be, to view objects as bound to their backgrounds, uh, as weird as that is. So if I were an, uh, if I were an Eastern thinker and I, and and I was looking at the picture of the lady holding the mirror, it would be very confusing to me because uh, of course she's holding the mirror. She does have a body back there, but uh, they would see things in context, so they would see her as invisible, uh, as part of her as invisible. As weird as that is, and of course the other picture is a picture of Michael Jackson with his collar up and whatnot. Uh, but if you if you just look at the dots, of course it's nothing at all. But if you if you uh, if if you're able to see it that way, then you can see Michael Jackson in there. 
East Asians have been socialized from such a, a young age to attend to relationships that they do so unconsciously scanning scenes. So when they see something, they try to put things together. As uh, Western thinkers, of course, we don't do that. Uh, we focus on select things. Um, uh, Westerners have been socialized to attend to focal objects, and they thus habitually tend to direct their attention at such objects. So a lot of times we don't see the forest. All we do is we see the trees. And as Eastern thinkers, of course, they are trained from, from, uh, from youth uh, to, uh, to, to see the entire forest rather than the trees. So they don't see the individual trees. They can't identify the individual trees to you, but they can tell you that the forest was five acres. It was, it was five acres. And of course, if we're looking at a forest, I'm looking out, outdoors right now, and, and uh, what I see is a, uh, is a willow tree. Uh, and so despite the fact that I have a number of trees in my, in my yard, you could call it a forest, I guess, if you wanted to, uh, I can identify each tree because I'm a Western thinker. I, I focus on each individual, uh, each individual tree. And of course, this is an optical illusion, the picture right beside uh, the uh, text is a, an optical illusion. Now, oddly enough, this has a lot to do with what, how, how our, our art is put together. If we look at the art of East Asia, we can see that the art is very different from Western art. East Asian art is painted with a higher horizon, creating more context in the picture. So there's more background, so we're looking at more background. And not only is, is this uh, something that artists will do, painters will do, but it's also something that photographers will do. And we'll see that later on uh, as we're talking about photography. And we see that uh, uh, in their web pages. Uh, so if you go to a web page uh, from China or Korea or, or Japan, it's much more involved. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot of things going on. There's more background. Um, East Asians in their portraits, uh, the background is much more complex and the figures in the painting tend to be smaller than in, in Western art. And so there we go. Uh, in China, of course, as you can see, that's very involved. This is a picture of the, this, this house. It's a picture of the house, oddly enough. Uh, but of course, um, but we see everything else as well. I mean, there's mountains and, and fog and whatnot. And with the young lady, of course, uh, she has a traditional Chinese gown on, um, and she's sitting there, and we can see that she's a very attractive young lady, and she's holding roses, uh, but behind her, it is very, uh, it's very complex back there. Uh, so we could either look at her, or we could look at the background as far as that is concerned. These are Japanese paintings, and as you can see, the figures are smaller, and the context, there's a lot going on in both of these pictures, uh, and the people, of course, are we really trying to identify the people? I guess that's a question that you have to ask yourself, but of course, as, uh, as Westerners, that's the way that we paint, uh, the way that we put pi pictures together, we are trying to identify the individual in the picture, we have Mona Lisa, of course, on the right. Not sure who the, what the picture on the left is, uh, but as you can see, we could identify each and every uh, figure uh, in the picture. Uh, I have no idea. Anyway, it's, these are two pictures from the Louvre, and of course, they're very old. They're very, very old pictures. Michelangelo, Michelangelo painted uh, uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, and as you can see, there's not a whole lot back there. And if you look at this, the other picture, the one on the left, uh, you can see that the, the people aren't the most important thing in the picture. The background is not really that important. Masuda and Gonzalez and uh, their colleagues in 2008 had American and Eastern Asian, East Asian students draw lands, landscapes with person, a river, a tree, a house, and a horizon. And they were seeking to see the difference between the two groups. And I only have one example of, uh, of this. This is uh, 
This is a picture <laughs> drawn by an East Asian. East Asians drew a, a horizon that was significantly higher in, in the picture than it was uh, for Americans. Uh, East Asians tended to provide a more complex background in their drawings. East Asians included 75% more contextual objects than did Americans. East Asians were more likely than Americans to situate their objects in the context. So the context, as you can see from this picture, uh, the person is the little pink thing right down here in the bottom, but everything else is far more important than, than this one, one person. As a matter of fact, we can barely tell it's a person. I guess it, it's got a head. Its feet are kind of messed up, but hey, what can we say? When East Asians uh, take photographs of others, uh, they tend to include more background. And this is a, a, an Asian picture. Uh, they also tend to have smaller figures in their portraits uh, compared to Americans. And I have some examples uh, that I will show you right now. But as you can see, the background seems to be just as important in this picture as the two young ladies dressed in Comic-Con outfits. And of course, these are two more pictures. Uh, this is a, a child with a dog crawling on its head. And then the lady who's looking at her, brushing her teeth, I think. Yeah, I imagine she's brushing her teeth. Anyway, you can see that she's not, she is the most important thing in the picture, as is the child. But there's a lot more background in the pictures. Uh, there you go. Little girl's the most important thing, of course, her and her messed up face. Uh, but as we you can see, she's not really the very large in the picture. I, I, she's fairly large. But here, here's the way Americans take pictures. As you can see, the background, the context, it's not important. It's the three kids. Uh, once again, we see exactly the same thing. It's not the fact that he these uh, little boys have a uh, have a barbed wire fence behind them. It's the fact that uh, that they're the ones in the picture, and of course, uh, the four kids in front of the school bus. Uh, same situation. Uh, we can see it's a school bus, but that's just about it. And the family, you know, in front of their garage door. Uh, where would you take a picture? Of course, they're all going on a trip. I'm guessing, and they're all packed and ready to go. And then, of course, we have the other picture of the uh, two individuals in bed. And there is stuff behind him, but, you know, who cares what it is? It's the fact that uh, he's showing off his guns. <laughs> and they're smiling. When was, this is a, 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 an Asian picture, by the way. You can, you can tell by the context. When Masada and Gonzalez and colleagues in 2008 looked at American and East Asian Facebook pages, they found that East Asian photos had smaller figures and larger backgrounds compared to American photos. And obviously in this picture, she is very important in this picture, but the background is also uh, a part of the picture and very, very important part of the picture. And of course, these are also Asian pictures, as you can see. Uh, the two young ladies are uh, Asian. And these are two more pictures. I apologize, young ladies in her underwear. Not exactly, but as you can see, the, uh, the background is just as important as the young lady is, as is the, the picture on the right. <clears throat> Looking at Japanese photographs of buildings, researchers discovered that these photographs had, had more boundary structures than American photographs. And of course, this is a Japanese picture. You can tell by the tiny little, <laughs> tiny little van uh, down here. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot more boundary to it. And of course, uh, when they're taking pictures of landscapes, of course, they're far busier than American photographs of landscapes. And as you can see, this is a, a, a derelict Japanese building, and this is a pagoda with a bridge and, uh, and trees that are chained there changing because of autumn. Um, once again, these are Japanese photographs of buildings. Uh, that theoretically, they're selling, I'm guessing. Look at that door <laughs> on the left. Okay, yeah, so yeah, as you can see, there's a lot more boundaries to it.
And if you look at an American photograph, the background is, you know, that's not that important. We have the church, we have the Capitol building, we have a school, old schoolhouse on the right, we have a, a business building on the left, we have the Chrysler building in New York City, but of course the Chrysler building is of course the most important figure in the photograph. Since cities in East Asia tend to be more crowded than Western cities, living in the busier physical environment fosters the ability to attend to a lot more information at once. So they're used to seeing a lot of things. They're used to seeing a lot of people. They're, it's very, very crowded. Uh, well, I, I showed you pictures earlier of, um, of uh, Japanese people getting on. They have to <laughs> they have people that push them on, onto the, uh, the subway cars. Of course, that would never happen in the United States. It'd probably start a fist fight if they tried to push people onto uh, subways in the United States. Uh, when you look at uh, how scientists from East Asia present their findings on posters, they had busier posters with more words than North American participants. I was at an uh, international uh, psychology seminar in uh, Vancouver, and there were some people from China and Japan and, uh, and Korea, uh, and they had posters just like, like we did. Um, and it, the interesting thing was that you could very, the posters, it was like in uh, 11 or 12 font, you know, you were looking at the posters and you couldn't tell. This is a, uh, uh, an American poster on, on your left. It's an American poster. I'll show you a picture of, of, uh, of an Asian poster. There you go. That's what it looks like. And that's what we were seeing. You know, you can't really read the whole thing. Uh, it's almost like reading a journal article. Uh, the, the writing is so small, you have to get really right up on top of it in order to see it uh, or in order to read it. But that's the way they do things in, uh, in Asia. It's a little bit different. Uh, researchers looked at uh, government and university websites uh, in East Asia and North America. The Asian websites were much longer than the North American websites and had significantly more links and words. The East Asian websites were busier with more information for people to navigate. And of course, this is an example of a Japanese, I think. It's a Japanese website. Uh, and as you can see, it's extremely busy. There's a lot of information there. American websites, not nearly as busy. Researchers discovered that Westerners were likely to explain uh, people's behaviors in terms of their underlying dispositions, while East Asians and possibly people from other cultures were more likely to exp explain people's behaviors in terms of contextual variables. And this is a good example. And this is what I want you to remember. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, when, when we're talking about Eastern and Western, uh, we're looking f to blame somebody. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure dispositional. We're more, as Western thinkers, we are more dispositional. We're trying to figure out why something happened. Um, and we're trying to, we're trying to bl find somebody to blame. Uh, situational attribution is a little, is a lot different. Uh, situational attribution, they're trying to figure out what the context is uh, as to why something happened. That was my dog, if you heard him. <laughs> He's yawning. When people from India and the United States were asked to describe a person, the Americans were more likely to describe people in abstract personality traits, uh, and Indians describe people in concrete behaviors that they observe. So we're looking at somebody's personality. We're trying to figure out why they were such a jerk. We're trying to figure out why they did something. Uh, but as uh, Asians, uh, they just identify people by what they did. Uh, she is friendly. She brings cakes to my family on festival days. These are you know, these these are our attributes. They they see everything in context. Researchers analyzing news stories of murders in the United States, China, and Japan discovered that East Asian papers described the murders in situational terms. The murderer had a rivalry with another student. 
They had been recently fired. The American reports tried to interpret the, the situation from a dispositional point of view. The murderer had a very bad temper. The shooter was described as mentally unstable. And of course, this is what we do with any of these mass shootings, especially the mass shooting in, uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, we're trying to figure, we couldn't figure out why in the world this guy would do what he did. Uh, if we were Asian, we wouldn't have cared uh, as much trying to figure out you know, how, how, how we can uh, change his disposition. We can change the way that he is. If we, could, if we could have gotten to him before he started shooting people, then potentially we could have stopped it. As uh, Asians, they would, have, they would have seen this as, as momentarily contextual. That's all it is. Uh, so that there is no stopping this. There would be no stopping them, um, the, the shooter in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, they would see it as, as impossible to stop. And of course, we're trying to figure out why this happened and what his disposition was so that to determine why he did it. Personality information is not seen as equally important for explaining the behavior of others in all cultural contexts. Westerners tend to use personality information more for understanding others and themselves, of course, than East Asians do. And of course, this is really important to us now that uh, uh, that we're that 75 million people in the United States are under lockdown. Um, don't worry about me. I'm I'm pretty much isolated, and I'm I'm not going anywhere. Uh, we may be driving down to next week. We may be driving down to Arizona next week just to get my car, but we're not going to try to interact with anybody. Uh, you guys have about as many cases of coronavirus as we do, but we have to pick up my daughter tomorrow who has been in Florida, and Florida has uh, over 500 cases, uh, so she may, be, she may be more contaminated than we are, certainly, than in Iowa, if you look at how many cases there are in Iowa and how many cases there are in uh, in Arizona, it's about the same. You guys have maybe 10 or 12 more than we do, and you have more deaths than we do. We don't have any deaths here. Um, but when we're, so when this coronavirus first started, of course, it started in China, in the Wuhan province. We talked about it a couple times, uh, and we were joking about it earlier, uh, about the, the coronavirus. Um, Asians, of course, <laughs> as Americans, we have to worry about uh, we have to worry about the fact that people are very difficult to control. Uh, but in Asia, of course, they don't have that problem. When they lock things down, it's it's locked down, and, and people don't break the rules. Uh, but in the United States, of course, we see ourselves as individualistic, uh, just like you know, should I travel to, to Arizona? Uh, potentially I shouldn't. Um, it's dangerous for me because I'm so old and I'm theoretically immunocompromised. So potentially I shouldn't travel at all, but uh, uh, we probably will. Um, and the reason is because we're so individualistic and that's part of my personality. Uh, of course, I've been through this several times. Um, working in medicine, I've been in uh, I've uh, seen outbreaks of, of different uh, diseases, hepatitis and the flu and whatnot. I actually was in a coronavirus outbreak in Germany, but of course it was different than this was a mutated fo form. Um, the form that we saw in Germany was uh, walking pneumonia. And that's a little bit different, I guess. Anyway, so uh, when and this is something that we need to think about. As psychologists, of course, uh, one of the things that uh, we have to worry about are uh, how, how are people handling this lockdown thing? Um, I was talking to my wife this morning about uh, different personalities and how they handle these kinds of things. And uh, it's possible that we may have an uptick of uh, suicides in the United States. And that's because people are 
people have created a world, a way of seeing themselves, and this has to do with the social context. And since the social context will be gone, or the social context will have changed, uh, people will start looking at themselves differently, and maybe they won't like what they see. Uh, so there's always a possibility that, uh, and, and of course they were talking, they talk a lot about stress on, on uh, television and uh, handling the stress. Uh, of course, I've been through this so many times. It doesn't really bother me a whole lot. Uh, but my w wife seems to be getting just a little bit stir crazy, a little bit more stir crazy than I am anyway, that's for sure. I mean, I could stay here and, and uh, you know, just sit in my office for, for days without, without any problems. But uh, she can't do that. She has to get on her. Uh, she's on Facebook, and she has a lot of people that are texting her and whatnot. Nobody's texting me, <laughs> which is fine with me. I have a hard time answering my emails anyway, which is something else I need to tell you. I uh, I will uh, uh, try to, to to look at my email, uh, you know, four or five times a day. Uh, and I'll answer them as, as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, people from uh, many other non-Western cultures show the pattern of focusing on a on situation rather than disposition, similar to East Asians. Uh, of course, as Americans, uh, we're we're pretty different. We're pretty different. <laughs> but uh, Asians, of course, they they see things at, as situational. Uh, so they're less likely to be uh, to, to see things the way that we're talking about. Religious groups uh, differ in their attributions as well. Uh, American Protestants are more likely than American Catholics to make dispositional uh, attributions. Uh, this difference between sects appears to be a function of Protestants having a greater commitment to the idea that people have individual souls, a um, little bit different. It's it's the reason that the church split. Once upon a time, of course, there was just the Catholic Church. Uh, once upon a time, there was just the Christian Church, and then it split into Orth Eastern Orthodox and Catholic, and then the Catholic Church split into all of these different uh, uh, denominations. They, you know, the Protestants, and the reason they call them protesters or Protestants is because they're pr protesting against the central uh, control of the church. So people who are Catholic uh, have a, an easier time accepting uh, people telling them what to do. <clears throat> Protestants uh, have a more difficult time. And Protestants, of course, are, try to read people's personalities uh, to, to determine why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, the picture on the, on, on the left uh, of the text uh, the uh, people on the right are the Catholics and the people on the left are the Protestants and they're both pointing at each other. It's kind of an interesting picture. Um, kind of curious. This is a joke. Jesus is coming to look busy. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. If people believe that uh, people are judging them on the basis of their uh, soul, what their soul has done, it follows that uh, they are more likely to view the soul as being the cause of, of the individual's behaviors. Uh, so, and that's one of the reasons why Protestants and Catholics look at things a little bit differently. Uh, Protestants see each individual as, uh, you, you've got to decide for yourself whether you're going to go to heaven. Uh, Catholics, it's, a, it's, it's more of a group a concept. Uh, they, they see them uh, as, as long as they, you know, go to church and, and go to confession and whatnot. Uh, they they don't see any reason why they shouldn't go to heaven, but uh, a lot of Protestants, uh, a lot of Protestant denominations, claim that there's only one way to go to heaven, and it's the way of that pro of that denomination, uh, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or whatever, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, whatnot. <clears throat> anyway, it's a joke. Jesus is coming. Look busy, and that's for Protestants, of course. As it turns out, people's socioeconomic status predicts the kinds of attributions that people make. Working class Americans make more situational attributions 
and fewer dispositional attributions than middle-class Americans. This is really kind of important. Once upon a time, this has to do with politics. Uh, once upon a time, we had a president by the name of Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan decided he wanted to do away with welfare. As a matter of fact, he ran, that was part of his, his platform, was, was getting all these uh, uh, cheaters off of welfare. He kept calling them welfare, welfare cheaters. And you, um, you would think the working class people would be behind him because here they are, they're out there busting their tails, uh, trying to make enough money for their, for their uh, families. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that happened was the middle class Americans were the ones that were more likely, uh, middle class Americans were the ones that were more likely to be against welfare, as weird as that sounds. And the reason is because Reagan was able to paint uh, the welfare queen, uh, welfare mother, as, as an individual that was, for one thing, it was, it's a ra it was a racist thing because he painted them all black. Uh, he also painted them all as cheaters, and because of that, and because it was easier for a, a, a middle-class American to uh, identify these individuals as different from them, uh, they were uh, they were more likely to vote for Ronald Reagan. Uh, the same thing happened with um, with uh, Trump. When Trump ran for president, he he spouted a lot of conspiracy theories that made immigrants, and of course he painted immigrants as, as uh, the enemies of, of the state, uh, overrunning the country and whatnot. Well, middle class people bought, really bought into this, especially middle class males. And if you look at the statistic, st t statistics you can see that, that uh, middle class males were, were uh, the people that elected Donald Trump. Working class people, eh, sometimes they I'd say they were they saw things uh, more as middle class, sometimes as more as more working class. But as as one of the things that we talk about, of course, is that uh, uh, working class Americans are more situational. They understand these things. Sometimes you don't have any, you can't find work, and therefore you need help, for assistance from the government. And of course, middle class Americans. Uh, are more dispositional, and therefore they are looking more at personalities, and that's what Trump and that's what Reagan was. They were able to do is to uh, paint the personalities of these individuals. If you remember, uh, one of the things Trump said uh, on uh, while he was uh, running for president was that uh, that Mexicans were rapists. They were they weren't sending their best people. They're sending rapists and murderers across the border. And of course, if you talk to uh, select individuals that, that uh, listen to this stuff, uh, they will tell you that Mexicans are rapists and murderers. Uh, the vast majority of immigrants coming across the border are um, murderers and rapists, as weird as that sounds. So if we go to another country, if we go to France, we see exactly the same thing. Middle class people are more dispositional and uh, working class people are more situational. So they th see things in, more, in a more situational uh, s structure. This became really in interesting when uh, we had that, they had that wave of immigrants coming from Africa and the Middle East uh, when the uh, war with, uh, in Syria uh, really kicked up. We had all these immigrants that were trying to flee uh, the, the fighting, and uh, there were countries that accepted them. Some countries didn't accept them. But France, of course, was one of the countries that accepted a large number of immigrants or of refugees uh, coming in from the Middle East and from, uh, from Af North Africa. Why? Because they have a large working class uh, population and a smaller uh, middle class population, but they have the same situation as the Ameri as in the United States. The uh, working class uh, is more situational, and the uh, the uh, middle the working class is more situational, and the middle class is more uh, dispositional. And we see the same thing in Russia. Uh, the Russians, uh, the working class people are. are 
are more situational. They, they view things more situationally. And of course, the middle class more dispositionally. We see the same thing in India. Working class Indians, uh, Asian Indians, of course, uh, are more uh, situational and uh, middle class people are more dispositional. If analytic uh, thinkers tend to view the world as operating to a set of universal abstract rules and, and, and laws, they will apply these rules and laws when uh, trying to make sense of a situation. This is termed rule-based reasoning. And of course, these rules are supposed to fit all situations. So when they're trying to read a, uh, uh, a situation, as we did with Las Vegas, trying to figure out why the guy blast started blasting away at, uh, at that uh, concert, uh, we, were, we, we used logic, or we tried to use logic. Holistic thinkers should be more likely to make sense of the situation by considering the relationships among objects and events. They should look for, for evidence of events clustering together, such as similarity among events, or of temporal con, uh, contiguity, uh, contiguity. That's not a word. I don't know what that's, okay. This is, a, this is termed associative reasoning uh, because they're trying to put things together. They're, they're thinking more holistically uh, rather than separating things and, uh, and looking at them as, as separate incidences, as we would do in the United States. Westerners appear to, have to uh, view change as occurring in linear ways. Uh, change appears in static and predictable ways. Stocks rise after an election. Stocks, of course, will rise in 2020. East Asians believe that change uh, happens in fluid and unpredictable ways, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, they had the uh, coronavirus outbreak started in Wuhan province in uh, the middle of China. Uh, one of the things you need to know about the Chinese is that uh, they're, not, they're not, certainly not Western thinkers. Uh, but they also have a different way of looking at the world. Um, they tend to be fatalistic. In other words, they don't fear death, even though they don't really have a religion. Um, they, they have a philosophy, they have Confucian philosophy. But uh, they don't really have a religion of sorts. I guess you could call ta Tao uh, a, a religion, but it, it, there is no heaven and hell. You know, there's no gods. Uh, that they really look at. Uh, Buddha, of course, was a, is a philosophy. It's not really a religion. Uh, so the Chinese are more fatalistic. And if they happen to die, if, if they're in a dangerous situation and they die, it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. I mean, Western thinkers have been trying to figure out what life's all about and, and uh, what death is all about for, you know, forever. And the Chinese, of course, look at it uh, in a more fatalistic fashion. Uh, so if, if they're on top of a building, if they're working on top of a building and they fall off and they die, um, they, don't really, they don't really miss that person because that's just the way the world is. Um, they're, they're just more fatalistic uh, in their way of see, seeing things. And they see the world as, as totally unpredictable. This is a, a famous uh, story of the farmer, the farmer and his horse. Uh, one day an old farmer's, so this is in China, of course. One day an old farmer's uh, horse ran away from him. His neighbors came to comfort him, but he said, how can you know that this isn't a good thing, the fact that his horse ran away? A few days later, his horse came back, bringing a wild horse with it. His neighbors came to congratulate the old man who said, how can you know that this isn't a bad thing, the fact that I have two horses now instead of one? A few weeks later, the old farmer's son was trying to ride the wild horse and fell off, breaking his leg. When the, neighbor, the neighbors came over to express condolences, the old man said, how can you know this isn't a good thing, the fact that my son now has a broken leg. The next month, the war broke out, and all the able-bodied young men were recruited to fight it. 
the old farmer's son did not have to go because of his broken leg and survived with his father, whereas all the other children died. All the other sons died in the war, and his son was able to stay home because he had a broken leg. So, yeah, so everything is unpredictable. East Asians have been uh, shown to place more value on things that have happened in the past compared with the future. So they look more to the past uh, than they do to the future. And, of course, we see this. Uh, they honor their, their, their dead ancestors as if their ancestors are still alive. In Korea, they have a, um, a holiday where everybody in Korea goes and visits their ancestors. And the way they do this is they go to the ancestral graveyard and they take them, they take food. It's really bizarre because the, the, uh, the whole country will be shut down for a whole week while the people are traveling, you know, the people in Seoul are traveling to their ancestral homes uh, and they, have, they will have this elaborate picnic that they'll eat in the graveyard. They're all mostly Buddhists. Uh, they cremate their dead, uh, which is kind of kind of interesting. Anyway, they look more to the past than they do, do to the future. Of course, the opposite is true in the in with North Americans. We're always looking to the future. We're thinking about you know, saving money so that we can uh, we can retire. How much money do you need to be able to retire? That kind of thing. Attitudes toward the future vary across cultures, and East Asians have quite different expectations and predictions about the future compared with Westerners. And because we look to the future and they look to the past, it, it changes the way that their mind works, that they think. And that has to do with creativity as well. Creativity is a generation of ideas that are novel, useful, and appropriate. And, of course, that is a picture of somebody being creative. <laughs> His head exploded in a lot of different colors, as curious as that is. Westerners prefer novel objects more than Eastern Asi than East Asians. Uh, they generate a larger number of ideas when they are primed with individualistic thoughts than collectivistic ones. And Asian Americans show more divergent thinking when primed with American culture compared with Asian culture. The novelty part of the equation appears to be, the, to be facilitated by individualism and Western cultural experiences. So we come up with more novel ideas. Uh, we are trying to change things a great deal. Good creative ideas involve novel solutions that are appropriate for the problem at hand. Collectivism appears to be associated with the generation of useful rather than novel ideas. In collective contexts, people are socialized to be concerned about the opinions of others and to find solutions that will fit with the goals of the members of their group. And of course, we're going to talk more about that right now. Uh, they did a study. Uh, they looked at Singaporeans, and they were assigned uh, to work together, a group of people from Singapore. The researchers discovered that they were more likely to comment on appropriateness of the ideas than when they worked by themselves. Their ideas became less original in groups. As, as individuals, of course, when, they, when you put them in a group, they tried to make, they tried to make each other happy. And because of that, they came up with less original ideas. This is in Singapore. When the same research was done in Israel, they found that the Israelis were more affected by the presence of others, were not affected by the presence of others in the same way. In other words, they came up with more novel ideas because they put all of their ideas together and they came up with more, uh, more novel uh, concepts. When the same research was done in the Netherlands, they found that the Dutch were not affected by the presence of others in the same way. So the Dutch, of course, were more similar to the Israelis than they were to the Singaporeans. However, they did the same research in Korea, and they found that the Koreans reacted more similarly to the Singaporeans than the Israelis and the Dutch, because Koreans, of course, are East Asian, and they try to make each they try to make each other happy. They just want 
thing, people to get along. And it may be because it's such a crowded place, Asia. More collectivistic East Asian cultures with their emphasis on useful ideas are more likely to foster incremental innovations, whereas more individualistic Western cultures with their emphasis on novel ideas encourage more breakthrough ideas. And this is really kind of what the whole uh, the uh, Chinese tariff was about. The Chinese, are, are they, they want to take our ideas and they want to make them better. And that's what they do. They make better products. The Japanese did the same thing after World War II. The Chinese did this, or the uh, Taiwanese did the same thing after World War II. So we would make a television set in the United States. And then th they would uh, take the television set and they would make it smaller. Or they would take the television set and they would, they would make... Uh, create a remote control for the television set. So Americans come up with big ideas, Westerners come up with big ideas, and Asians tend to incrementally change those ideas. Japan is the world leader in terms of the number of patents it receives each year. Most of their patents represent incremental improvements, particularly in telecommunications, information technology, and electronics small changes, incremental changes that make things better, that make things smaller, but of course eventually uh, they, uh, they're the ones producing all of these things because they have all these strange incremental changes. The uh, picture on your left shows uh, people sleeping in the subway. Uh, of course the subways are very crowded. I don't know. So <laughs> these are inventions by, that people have had because they fall asleep in the uh, in the uh, in the subway, and as you can see, the lady's got a, a hat on that keeps her her head from from falling forward too far. She can uh, sit up and and sleep at the same time. Uh, J Japanese are really kind of interesting. Um, the falling asleep in public is is not a problem as far as they're concerned. Uh, they fall asleep at their desk when they're working. And this is okay. It's because they're working so hard and they're working such long hours. Uh, the, uh, in Japan, uh, sometimes you'll go to work and, of course, you're being paid for eight hours a day and you'll stay there for 12. You don't get paid for the last four hours, but, of course, because that's the culture, uh, that's what you do. And because of that, because they work so hard and because they work such long hours, the Japanese fall asleep at their desks. And this is called Inamuri. Inamuri is what it's called. Uh, falling asleep at your desk. Something that doesn't happen in the United States. And if, of course, if it did happen in the United States, you'd get in trouble for falling asleep at work. But in Japan, it's a, it's a very common practice. Talking in language have held a privileged position in much of the Western intellectual world uh, history. Among the ancient Greeks, Homer included, concluded that there was no greater skill than to be a good debater. Ouch, I'm sorry. And Socrates thought that knowledge existed within people and could be revealed only through verbal reasoning. So the word language is extremely important in the Western world. It's not true in the Eastern world. In Judeo-Christian beliefs, the word was viewed as sacred because of the divine power to create. So if you read the Bible, of course, it says um, that the word is, is God and, and, and that is divine and, and, you know, the whole thing. In the United States, the freedom to speak one's mind is a birthright protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And this, of course, is known as free speech. In the United States, extremely important concept. Speaking is valued in the West because it is viewed as an act of self-expression and as inextricably bound to thought. So the more we think, the more we speak. So speakers are very important to the Western world. However, it's not the same way in Asia. This is a Laotian proverb on the, on the uh, left. Listen with one ear, be suspicious with the other. That's the way they, they view speech. In many East Asian cultural traditions, there has been less emphasis on talking, if not outright suspicion, of the spoken word. Lao Tzu 
wrote, he who knows does not speak, he who speaks does not know. This may answer a lot of questions about uh, some of the old television shows or movies. The Charlie Chan, why was Charlie Chan so, uh, so good at uh, solving crimes? It's because he thought and didn't, didn't uh, talk. Uh, whereas other, other policemen, Western policemen, of course, are just gabbing up a storm and not solving the crime. Here's Charlie Chan watching things, keeping his mouth shut, and solving the crime. Practitioners of many Eastern religions pursue truth through silent meditation rather than through spoken prayer. And, of course, spoken prayer is not, a, is not all that common in, uh, in Tibet and uh, in other Eastern uh, countries. A Korean proverb states, an empty cart makes more noise. In other words, the more you talk, the less you have to say. Eastern cultural traditions have not cultivated a belief that thought and speech are closely related. Of course, you can imagine if they had the concept of speaking being important, that with all their all the crowds that they have, the fact that they're they're so overcrowded, uh, that would be a cacophony. You couldn't you couldn't hear yourself think uh, because because of all the noise of everybody talking. But if you go to, to uh, if you go to Japan or China or Korea, and I've been to Korea and and Japan, uh, they don't make a lot of noise. They don't talk a lot. Japanese mothers have been shown to speak less to their children than American mothers. Chinese infants as young as seven months have been shown to vocalize less in response to laboratory events than a European American infants. Much of what is communicated in the course of a conversation goes beyond the actual words that are used and is expressed in nonverbal gestures, facial expressions, and voice tone. People uh, seem to be easier to upset in an email than when they are face -to when you are face to face with them. You can't, they can't see you wink or smile or make whatever your nonverbal uh, uh, gestures are uh, to uh, dissipate the uh, anger uh, that is being created. People often resort to adding emoticons uh, or abbreviations to their emails or text messages to add the nonverbal contextual cues that are lacking in emails or text text messages. Of course, I don't understand any of these things. I don't use emoticons, and I certainly don't use the other abbreviations. Uh, well, anyway. Nonverbal communication is important in all cultures, but there are some rather pronounced cultural differences in the degree to which communication relies on explicit verbal information versus more implicit nonverbal cues. So as you can imagine, in the United States where we say everything, we have one way of looking at things, and Asians have another way of looking at things. Since they don't speak as much, uh, their facial expressions are far more important. And the way that they say things is, will become important, as weird as this sounds. In high-context cultures, people are deeply involved with each other, and this involvement leads them to have much shared information that guides their behavior. Much of what is to be communicated can be inferred because people have a great deal of information in common that they can rely on, and thus they can be less explicit in what they say. So they don't have to say as much. We know this person and, and we know what, they, what they're thinking. East Asians are good examples of high context cultures. Western and English speaking countries are generally good examples of low context cultures. What is conveyed in verbal communication in East Asian languages is less explicit than what is communicated in English. And of course, uh, on the left you see a, uh, a Western man trying to talk up a, uh, uh, an, an Asian woman, and uh, uh, most of what he says is, is empty, as you can see from his, his, uh, his verbal bubbles there. And of course, she's bored to death because he's saying what she has already read in him. So he's, he's repeating himself. 
or maybe he's <laughs> she's reading more than he wants her to. Uh, the words that are said in Japan are often less important than the, the way that they are said. I've told you before, in Japan, they never say no. Uh, it's, it's rare for them to say no. Uh, and the reason is because, uh, is because it's insulting. Uh, it, uh, is, it's not a, a social thing to do, sociable thing to do. So this may be one of the reasons why during World War II, of course, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. It was fairly obvious to the Japanese that they were going to do that. And if we had been aware, if we had been Asian, we would have known that they were going to sneak attack, uh, well, which they didn't consider a sneak attack. And it's one of the reasons why they don't even talk about it as, 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 a, as, as an attack. It was an attack, but it was an obvious attack. And, they, of course, they, they see it as, as, uh, as all right, as, as a good strategy is to... Is to uh, it's to sneak up on your opponent and attack them. A pause and a strained look on the face of a Japanese speaker communicates the information that they have is dissatisfying no matter what the words they use. So the words aren't nearly as important as their facial expressions, as their nonverbal communication. And, of course, that's what you're supposed to read. If you watch a Japanese movie, which is just fascinating, um, despite the fact you can't understand Japanese, you know what's happening. It's almost like silent films where the people's facial expressions were more important. Well, they were, obviously, were more important. And they would say this whole string of dialogue, and then, of course, they'd put up on the screen you know, five or six words. Uh, <clears throat> but you were supposed to read their facial expressions. Well, you know, things have changed. Has, have changed a lot, but not... Not for the Japanese. The Japanese still don't use as many words as we do in the United States. The key information is conveyed not verbally, with the content of the words sometimes being rather empty. And of course, that's if you've ever watched. Uh, there's a good movie that deals with this, um, Mr. Baseball, with uh, Tom Selleck. He goes. He's a, a, an American ball player. Goes over to Japan. And he has all these cultural problems. And one of the problems is they will say something to him. And, and uh, of course, he's n half the time he's not even looking at them when they're saying them to him. And, and uh, he's getting the wrong message. So he starts dating this woman, uh, or he st starts hitting on this, uh, this one Japanese woman. And it turns out that she is the, uh, is the daughter of, his, of the manager of the baseball team. And uh, he, he, asked, he asked Yoshi, his, his handler, his Japanese handler, what, uh, if there was any problem with, with him going out with this lady. And he, he gave him an answer, which to a Japanese person would mean, yeah, there's a lot of problems. Uh, and, of course, he didn't read it because, one, first of all, he wasn't even looking at him. And second of all, uh, it was, it was a, almost a poem, uh, and he, he couldn't interpret it correctly. Anyway, so he got, in, he got into trouble for dating the manager's daughter. It's a fascinating movie, uh, and it's, it's very real if you've ever been to Japan, of course. Since so much is conveyed through nonverbal communication by the Japanese, they tend to have uh, far more trouble leaving messages on answering machines. You can hear their words, but you can't see their facial expressions. And because of that, of course, they don't. They have a difficult time leaving messages. They're more selective of their wording because they are visualizing how the person on the other end is receiving the message. Fascinating stuff. Okay, that's the end of chapter nine. Uh, we are done with the chapter. Uh, and that's all that I'm going to lecture this week as far as cultural psychology is concerned. Uh, I will give you another lecture next week. Uh, by next week, I, I'll have it up by next week. Uh, that you will need to uh, to, to watch, um, and each each week I will uh, I will do another chapter. Uh, sorry, this is the way things have to be, but uh, you know that's just the way the world works, I guess. Uh, so I'll see you next week, or I'll, you'll hear from me again next week, and I will do your discussion. I will grade all your discussion questions.
So uh, see you, see you later.